it's accounting. And again, just uh, maybe the size of the number of questions that you might see in your exam, um, 17 to 20 questions, which is anywhere from 20 to 25% of the questions in the mod three exam will be out of this accounting area. Um, the areas we're going to look at here, <clears throat> um, locate and review the financial statements of the financial report of the United States government. So we're going to look at first um, the um, as generated by the Treasury of the United States, the financial reports of the United States of America. And we're going to look at uh, some of the information in there. I remember, I guess, going back to when I took my exam, I think I mentioned to you that I took the Mod 3 exam first, and then I took a uh, drop back and did one and two. But the reason I took it first was um, accounting. And I basically, that's my educational background. And I figured, yeah worked 25, 30 years in accounting in the federal government, touching on accounting type issues. I say, hey, I knew this stuff pretty good. What I didn't realize was that in 1990, in terms of DOD and DOD financial management, the world kind of changed. And we moved away from budgetary accounting into proprietary accounting. Proprietary accounting being basically business type accounting. A financial report that you might pick up from General Motors, as an example, and rather than the standard form 133, the the uh, report on budgetary accounting. So that kind of threw me for a loop when I started to take that exam. Then I just quickly kind of took off my budgetary accounting hat and I put on my what I'd learned in school college, my proprietary accounting hat, and I started to look at things in terms of and answer the questions in terms of uh, generating financial reports, commercial financial reports. So in this whole section here that we have in this competency, there are maybe three, four PowerPoints, three, four pages to talk about budgetary accounting. Primarily everything we're going to look at is going to be proprietary accounting. Now, one of the first things that kind of, I guess, hit you in the face is, well, why are we doing this? Well, because we got laws and regulations following on those laws that dictate what DOD needs to do in terms of generating proprietary reports. So we're going to take a look at some of those. Third bullet on this PowerPoint, describe the role of each of the various organizations that do it to us talking basically about three organizations. That would be Treasury, Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and the GAO. Sometimes we refer to them as the three amigos when we're talking about financial management. Uh, this last bullet here lists list types and uses of government funds. Eh, I think one page, quick and dirty, talking about, uh, in fact, there's not even a PowerPoint on it, but listing things like trust funds, um, holding accounts, the general fund, et cetera. We'll cover those real briefly. Um, then we'll talk is a PowerPoint in here where we talk about DOD funds, um, not appropriated funds. That's a type of a DOD account. Then we got investment accounts. We got military trust funds. We got retirement accounts. So we'll look at some of those things. Look at the functions of proprietary, budgetary, and managerial cost accounting. And this is kind of interesting because, again, I mentioned proprietary and budgetary. Well, managerial cost accounting, again, we have, I think, maybe a PowerPoint on that at the very end of this competency. Um, managerial cost accounting. And they, uh, Dave mentioned this to you uh, earlier when he was talking about the Defense Working Capital Fund. You have to have the ability to be able to cost out a unit of production, a unit of effort. And if you think about it, that's really kind of a key thing to know about uh, as you generate the financial report on um, 
the Navy Working Capital Fund as an example. You have to know a little bit about managerial cost accounting. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences between proprietary, budgetary, and managerial cost accounting. We're going to look at general ledger account code structures, GLACs, GLACs. Uh, general ledger account codes uh, for the basic categories of accounts would be asset accounts, liability accounts, debt position accounts, budgetary accounts, revenue accounts, expense accounts, and each of those are have a different series of numbers: one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four, five, six, seven. So we're going to take a look at some of that kind of stuff. Um, and while we're doing that, we'll probably look at some um, briefly, some events that has to be journalized. And those of you who have had an accounting course in your past probably remember that we talked about um, in introduction to accounting 101, you talk about journalizing events. And the journal was the often referred to as the book of original entry. Something happens, an event, and now you have to record that with a debit entry and a credit entry in your basic journal entry. And from there, let those debit and credit transactions drive that the balance in that particular account. And then at the end of the operating period, say the end of the fiscal year, we basically balance those accounts, add up the debits, add up the credits, and either debits will exceed credits or credits will exceed debits. And then those dollar amounts wind up in a trial balance, making sure that all the debits equal all the credits. Basic principle of accounting. And from there, we generate our financial statements. And we'll take a look at some of the Again, from DOD standpoint, that last bullet there, we're going to look at some DOD financial statements. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because they're not worth the paper they're written on. Oh, what's he talking about? Well, there are some outside references that I need you to jot down here if you don't have the course textbook. The first thing that I'd suggest that you look at is the FMR, Volume 6B. Now, what's that? That gives you the form and content that the DOD financial statements are supposed to show. Form, uh, types of statements, content, what's in those statements. And those are basically driven by OMB circular. 136. So that's the second thing I want you to jot down there. OMB circular A136. And that's financial reporting requirements. Basically, OMB saying to every federal agency, office, and bureau, here's what the structure, here's what the format of your financial reports look like. And then I'd suggest suggest to you that and, and that you go in and you go to DOD and you look at, uh, well, excuse me, not DOD. Well, you go to DOD. You can look at DOD's annual financial reports. Look at the annual financial report that we generated for DOD. And you might want to even go and look at, and that would be the latest one was uh, 2021, last year's. And then you might want to take that a step farther and look at the 2021 financial report of the United States of America, U.S. government. There's really some interesting stuff in there. Now, the financial report of DOD, and I just happen to have a couple of pages here, it goes on for a little over 300 pages. That's the annual financial report, Department of Defense, fiscal year 2021. Now, let's say that your rich uncle Sam dies and winds up leaving you $10,000 and you decide you're going to invest that in stocks and bonds, stocks, let's say. So 
yeah, you're interested in going and investing in the auto industry. So let's say General Motors. So you, you go down to your broker and probably what you're going to do is ask the broker for the latest financial report of General Motors. And to see whether or not that's where you want to dump that $10,000. So what would be the first thing that you think you might want to look at in that financial statement? And oftentimes people say, oh, I'm going to look at the bottom line. I'm going to look at PE, price earnings ratio. I want to look at uh, dividends. How much would I get back? And none of those would really be the right answer. The right answer should be the auditor's statement. If the auditors using generally accepted accounting principles and practices, and I'm going to talk to you about those. If the auditors using auditing standards looked at the financial statements and said, and gave you a disclaimer or gave you a, a um, less than satisfactory position. Why would you even bother to try to look through the rest of the material? And that's exactly what DOD has gotten since the very first of these financial reports that we've generated going all the way back to 97 up to 19 uh, up to 2021. The one that was published on the um, 15th of November of 2021. So I'll just you know briefly I want to talk to you a little bit about this audit report here. This is a statement by the DOD IG for audit. And they said on the very first page of their, their uh, cover letter here, it says, our attached independent auditor's report consists of three things. The report on the basic financial statements. In other words, balance sheets, statement of operations, um, changes in net position, the financial statements that need to be generated. That was their first. Second thing they talked about was the report on internal control, especially over financial issues, financial reporting, internal controls. OMB Circular A123. Remember, we had whole company and competency on that previously. Then the second thing, the third thing they reported on is the report of compliance with applicable laws, regulations, contracts, and grant agreements. In other words, the law says that here's how this stuff will be handled. So they issued some reports. So let me talk briefly about the reports. Here's what they said on the second page, auditors now, DODIG for audit, the report on internal control over financial reporting, talking about A123, identified 28 material weaknesses, remember Dave talked to you about that, and four significant deficiencies related to the DOD's internal controls over financial reporting. Oops, 28 material weaknesses. Then it goes on and says the report on compliance with applicable laws and regulations, contracts, grant agreements, identified seven instances of non-compliance with provisions of applicable laws and regulations, contracts, and grant agreements. That doesn't sound too promising, does it? Now on the financial statements, what they did is they gave us a disclaimer. And a disclaimer means that the information in here is so screwed up, I cannot give you an opinion. I can't give you a qualified opinion, and I certainly can't give you an unqualified opinion, which used to be what we call the clean opinion. So the auditors looked at then the entities within DOD. Now, what's an entity? An entity is a business, it's in business, stay in business. I can still remember way back when I was in undergraduate school, this professor making that statement. In other words, who has to prepare a financial report? A business, an entity. 
And what is it? It's a business that's in business to stay in business. Now, we in DOD following guidance that we get from a professional standard setting board that I'll tell you about in a bit here, have identified entities within DOD. And the entities are basically Army general funds, direct appropriated funded stuff, and not, not uh, yeah, Army general funds, Army working capital funds. Navy general funds, Navy working capital funds, Air Force general fund, Air Force working capital funds. And then the same thing on the defense side. There's a defense overall general fund and defense overall working capital funds. So let me just show you here. Auditors issued disclaimers of opinions on the following components, Army, Navy, Air Force, financial statements that were required to undergo audit. Army General Fund, disclaimer. Marine Corps General Fund, disclaimer. Navy's General Fund, disclaimer. Air Force General Fund, disclaimer. That takes care of the general funds. Let's look at the working capital funds. Army Working Capital Fund, Disclaimer, Navy Working Capital Fund, Disclaimer, Air Force Working Capital Fund, Disclaimer. And then they go on and they say, in addition to these components, they also looked at and offered opinions on the following defense type activities, or not Army, Navy, Air Force, okay? Defense Health Program General Fund, Disclaimer. Defense Information Systems Agency General Fund, DISA, disclaimer. Defense Logistics Agency General Fund, disclaimer. Defense Logistics Agency Working Capital Fund, disclaimer. And it goes on and on and on. Gee, I would hate to be the DOD Undersecretary of Defense uh, Financial Management Comptroller. That ain't good. And this has gone on since 1997. Now, one of the things that Dave's going to show you at the very beginning of the last competency when he does audit with you this afternoon is how DOD has kind of organized a, what do you want to call it, a tiger team, let's say, to clean this up. And it's a, it's a fire team, financial improvement and audit readiness. Now it's audit remediation. They say that we finally got the statements to the point where they could be looked at. So now we're going to think about, OK, auditors are looking at them, the statements. They can finally say, and we did this in 21, the auditors could finally say, and here's the 3,000 things that we found wrong. And, and they did. Two, three thousand things. The auditor said, here's what's wrong. So now they've changed this, and you'll see this in one of the first PowerPoints Dave's going to show you. But now they're talking about audit remediation. In other words, what are we going to do to fix this stuff? That's where we're going right now. So you can see we got some major problems. Now, think about this a second. If DOD makes up one half of the one third of the discretionary operations in the federal government, and DOD cannot get a clean opinion, when those numbers are rolled up by the Treasury into the United States government's financial statements, there's no way that the GAO, who by the way is the auditor of the United States government's financial reports, there's no way the GAO can do anything other than give a disclaimer. So, you know, the, the onus, if you will, is on finally or ultimately getting a clean financial report at the at the federal government letter level is DOD. It's on us. And that's why we're spending billions of dollars trying to clean this stuff up. As a matter of fact, I had a report on it one time. I don't know exactly what I did with it anymore, but they said that the number of hours that 
were spent in DOD to try to pull this audit, this, these financial statements together. It's horrendous the number of hours and the cost is, you know, in billions of dollars. So a lot of people are saying, well, why are we doing this? It's stupid. Well, we're doing it because the law says we got to do it. So let's take a look first at um, the accounting. We're talking about budgetary, proprietary, and managerial. Now, along this PowerPoint, where it says budgeting over here, right over here someplace, I'd like you to jot down the word, the, the term fund control, F-U-N-D, fund control. That's what we're doing. Talking about these funds, colors of money. That's what we try to do with budgetary accounting, the status of funds report. Okay. Next to proprietary accounting, I'd like you to jot down cost management, cost management. And if you think about it in commercial accounting, what are you trying to do? Well, you're trying to maximize your bottom line. And oftentimes the way you do that is try to manage your costs, keep your costs in control, right? proprietary accounting. And then managerial cost accounting, what we're trying to do there is manage the, uh, the uh, indivi identify individual unit cost, managerial cost accounting, identify the cost of doing a widget, producing a widget. That widget could be, I don't know, a service. It could be producing a, um, a good, um, an item, but we need to cost those out. And the, and you'll see, I've only got, I think, maybe one PowerPoint at the end of accounting that we talk about managerial cost accounting. And the problem is, is that there are so many inter-agency costs that drive, let's say, the cost of doing something in DOD, inter agency, our intergovernmental costs. Intra, that's the stuff within, let's say, Navy, Navy Working Capital Fund. Right? That's easy enough to, to measure. But is there something, a cost, for example, um, that might be incurred by the Office of Personnel Management um, that should be passed from OPM to the Navy's working capital fund? Yeah, possibly. Should there be maybe some cost of the effort associated with handling, managing, and controlling the military retirement trust fund? Yeah, sure. I mean, you've got in the Navy working capital fund, you've got Navy military personnel working in there. Now, somebody's handling their retirement, potential retirement, future retirement. And some of those costs should probably be transferred as well. Right? That's really tough to try to figure out, well, how much of that stuff should be transferred? I'll talk more about that in a bit. Now, why are we doing this? Well, people want to see what's going on. You know, years ago, there's a, a statement that was made by, I guess it was Thomas Jefferson. He said, wouldn't it be nice if we could generate financial reports on the federal government's activities that look like what would be generated for the local businessman. So that citizens, the everyday citizen out there could look at it and say, oh, here's the revenue that came into the government and here's what it was used for, revenues and expenses. And then, you know, maybe even have a, at the end of the year, show a profit. Now, in the federal government, we would call that a surplus. And we haven't had many surpluses in the recent years. We used to have all kinds of surpluses years ago when the cost of the government was a heck of a lot less than it is today. Taxes, outstripped taxes is the revenue, and that outstripped was were greater than the cost of running the government. Bottom line would be a surplus. We had four surpluses uh, recently, I guess you could say, and that would be in 1998, 
99, 2000, and 2001. Four years of surpluses. And that was the end of the Clinton administration and the beginning of the Bush administration. Yep. The Congress did something with those profits. They gave some of us back, some of it back to us, which is kind of neat. You know, you filed your tax return and you got a little bit of money coming back. That was one way they handled it. Um, another way that they gave some of that back was by buying back some of the treasury bonds and bills. Debt. Reduce some of our debt. And another thing they did with the surplus, which obviously, I guess, in the mind of a politician was a great idea. They created new programs. On the fact, one of the programs that was created was Medicare Part D, the drug program. Up until 2000, there was no drug program per se. And then they created Medicare Part D. And the people looking into the crystal ball in the federal government that made forecasts associated with the future, the growth of, for example, the uh, GDP. And they made estimates that, oh, this is going to, our GDP is going to continue to grow at five, five and a half percent a year forever. That means we'll have ex all this extra money coming in that will be tapped, that will be taxed, which puts more money in our pockets so that we can fund programs. And everything went south and the money didn't come, but now we got these entitlement programs. <clears throat> Back in Harry Truman's time, it might have been Truman, it might have been somebody else, but <clears throat> made a statement that once you put, put a chicken into somebody's pot and a shivy in their garage, you can never take it away. That's what those entitlement programs are. These, are, these programs are unfunded when you look out 75 years. If you looked at the financial reports of the United States government, one of the supplemental reports that's in that is the 75-year projected shortfall of revenue that's needed to pay for Social Security and Medicare, the entitlement programs. And the last number I saw on that was that government on all these entitlement programs, looking out 75 years and measuring it, you might remember, um, when Dave did cost and economic analysis with you, measuring it in today's dollars. Looking out 75 years, why 75 years? Well, I think maybe they're looking at the average age of a citizen in the United States at death. So let's say you draw Social Security at 65 and you're anticipated to live to 75. How much is that going to cost us as a nation? $127 trillion short. Trillion. These programs are unsustainable. Unsustainable. And every year, GAO issues a audit on the entitlement programs. And every year, GAO says the same thing. These programs are unsustainable. We can't keep doing this. We got to do something about this. So I'm an inter, I'm a user, a citizen. I, I like looking at this stuff. I like to see what's going on with Social Security. What's going on with Social Security Administration? What's going on with our Department of Energy as an example? Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've been saying, does anybody know why in the 1970s we created the Department of Energy? Why did that come? David told you that. Dave told you that yesterday. And that's when OPEC hammered us with the oil embargo. And gas went from 35 cents a gallon to a buck 35 overnight. And we created the Department of Energy to be energy self-sufficient. That's what it was created for. And look what it's turned into. 20, 30, 40,000 employees running around talking about windmills. It's just insane. And 
I think at some juncture, people need to look at that and say, time out. I'm a citizen. I want to know what it's costing to run the Department of the Energy. I want to see what benefit we're getting out of that. I want to see the assets that you got. I want to see what your liabilities are. I want to see what your revenue and expenses are, proprietary reports. Congress, same thing. You can look at thinking, look at um, budget accounting reports, and you go into a Congress and you say, well, <clears throat> let's say last year I had, uh, I ended the year with unobligated appropriation, and they go, huh, what are you talking about? Oh, and I've got unliquidated obligations. Okay, so what? But you go in and you start talking about, well, here's my assets, here's my liabilities, here's the net worth of the agency, and oh, by the way, here is my net costs and revenue that I received. Basically, I received from you, Mr. Congressperson, appropriation, and I also received other sources of revenue, and those other sources would be tariffs, fee for service. We talked about that. I talked about that with you, and Dave did too, when we talked to some accounting, not accounting, but fiscal law stuff with you. Congress wants to see that. And Congress also wants to take, or get out of Congress, we talk internally. I would hope that most agency heads have some type of business background, some some type of acuity in what how to run a business, you would hope, because that's what they're running. I mean, take any agency, any any department that they're big business. And maybe they need to approach it with a business type approach. Dave covered that with you when he talked about the GPRA, Government Performance Results Act. Let's look at an A76. Let's look at a better way of doing a job. I mean, seriously, if I'm a businessman, and, which I am, and I want to look at maximizing my bottom line and Maybe the way to get there is continuously look at the way we're doing the job today. Remember that was that um, BPI, Business Process Improvement? Looking at how we're doing our jobs and finding out it and look, maybe coming up with a better way of doing a job. And again, agency heads and management within the agency should be, I think, attuned to that. And I don't know if we are at the federal government anymore. I'm, you know, one thing that I find I got as I get older that I really know less and less. I mean, it just, there's so much that's going on, so much issues that we have as a, as a nation, let's say, that sometimes you just want to throw up your hands and say, I'm done. Now, Here's one of these add-on PowerPoints, which basically just tells you what I just told you. Budgetary, talking about the flow and use of funds, i.e. from the appropriation to the payment. This is the oldest type primarily due to Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution. You remember that. No funds will be dispersed from the Treasury, but in consequence of an appropriation made by law. That's pretty straightforward. Then we have proprietary, asset liabilities, net position, revenue expense that I told you about. And what drove that, which just, you know, kind of hit everybody in the federal, in the face in the federal government, and that was that CFO Act of 1990. That's what required this. It's in the law. We're going to have every federal agency will have a chief financial officer, and that chief financial officer will be responsible for. And one of the responsibilities is financial, proprietary accounting. I talk managerial costs that I mentioned to you, cost of doing business to provide those goods and or services. Talking at the bottom about the F FMIA, Federal Financial Management Improvement Act of 1996, amongst other things, required the Department of the Treasury to come up with a standard cost accounting system that could be applied government-wide that still is not in existence. 1996, and we're in 2022. Too hard. You know, I, I, how do you go in and find out and cost out 
and then transfer from OPM, management costs associated with personnel that work in the Navy. Now, how do you do that? And it's, it's a nightmare, it's a nightmare. It's a big, big, big challenge. Other add-on, we've talked assets. You heard me talk assets, liabilities, and net position. In a way, this add-on PowerPoint I think is insulting your intelligence because I think the majority of the people that are in the financial management business and DOD have had at least one basic accounting course. I mentioned to you about these different, um, well, let's term, well, events, events. And, and I want you to be thinking about this a second. Uh, let's take that very first one up there. It talks about the president signs an appropriation bill into law. What does that give us? It gives us budget authority and it gives outlay authority, dispersing authority. And that dispersing authority, that outlay authority is driven by this appropriation warrant where the treasurer of the United States says to Navy, here's how much money I have in your O&MN account. Now, I should, let me take that back. Here's how much authority I have in your O&MN account to disperse money out of the treasury. So let's just say that your O&M Navy account has $100 billion in it at the beginning of the year based upon an appropriation. That doesn't mean there's $100 billion sitting in the treasury. That means, though, that they have the authority to disperse up to $100 billion. And what if it's not there? Oh, well, and we got to find it someplace. And that, you might remember yesterday, I said that at that juncture, the Treasury of the United States might borrow the money. It's got to find it someplace. Borrow the money. Now, the reason I'm dwelling on that is you can see that when we talk about the type of accounting transaction that this would impact budgetary and proprietary budgetary and proprietary i think one of the most important journal entries that we make in the federal government is the entry that we do when the president signs an appropriation bill into law And there are budgetary, i.e., we would debit appropriations realized. That's, and by the way, basic accounting for every debit, you have to have at least one credit. So our credit entry is um, appropriations are unapportioned, unapportioned appropriations. See, that's that third line in there, apportionment. All right. I'm going to flush this out a lot more with you when we get into looking at general ledger account codes a little bit later on. There's Article 1, Section 9 that I just mentioned to you. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And it goes on and it says a regular statement an account of receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. And that doesn't mean maybe once every 200 years, but by and large, from the beginning, all we ever really dwelled upon is budgetary accounting. We never really dwelled upon or looked at generating a financial statement that would look like what the butcher, baker, candlestick maker would do, and that what the average citizen can look at and understand. But we now have to do that based upon um, the guidance that we got, the instructions that we got under the law, that's that 1990 CFO Act. Here are This PowerPoint just simply says we've got, we're going to take a look at federal 
that's financial statements, i.e. the statements of the annual financial report of the United States of America. And this is the only PowerPoint that we have on this thing. Uh, if you had your course text, then there are three or four pages in here, which shows the fiscal year 19 balance sheet, statement of net costs, and statement of changes in net position. Okay. So what do you need to know about these? Well, as far as I know, there is no specific, there's no specific questions in the exam on what's in the balance sheet, what's in the statement of net costs, what's in the statement of net position. So I did mention something to you yesterday, though, and that was when we got to accounting, we're going to look at this statement of changes in net position. And one of the things we want need to look at prior to having a change in net position. And what's that? Well, that's the difference between revenue and expenses. And that difference is going to either be a gain, i.e. a, uh, a uh, surplus, or it's going to be a loss, which is a deficit, which is a debt of the period, a deficit of the period, which to cover would result in an increase in our national debt. We've got to get the money someplace to make the payments. Now, how do we figure out what that net, how do we figure out what those expenses are? Well, that's that second statement here, statement of net cost, not a statement of gross cost, not a statement of cost, but a statement of net cost. Well, what makes up the difference? I mentioned that to you yesterday. And I said that when we look at this, you would see, you don't have, we don't have a PowerPoint on it, but you would see a column in this report that says earned revenue. So we got gross cost of our operations, less earned revenue. The revenue, and I gave you a couple of examples yesterday. You get a passport, you pay for that passport. That revenue that they collect in the State Department will be utilized to cover some of the expenses of State Department generating passports. Yeah. DOD, uh, for example, for fiscal year 19, DOD shows $44 billion of earned revenue. $44 billion. How does DOD earn revenue? Well, or military sales, sales, let's say. Selling some of our excess equipment and therefore retaining that revenue to be able to offset some of the cost of running DOD. Just a couple of examples, but the total dollar amount, bottom line, in fiscal year 2019 of revenue that was earned was $418 billion. Uh, 2019, our cost of running the government was $5.2 almost $5.3 trillion. And we can reduce that by 418 billion of earned revenue, which if we didn't have adjustments, which we do, that would drive us down to a net cost of running the government of $4.8 trillion. Now there are some adjustments in there and that always bothers me. Adjustments, anytime I see that, I get a little, ANSI because if other than DOD, if other than DOD, which as I said, never gets a unmodified opinion, a clean opinion, then every other agency which was audited by either their IG or an outside audit, maybe um, KPMG, you know, 
Deloitte, somebody comes in and audited the agency's financials and they get a clean opinion. And why in the world would they get all of a sudden have to have adjustments? That tells me that the clean opinion wasn't as clean as it should have been. But in the 2019 statement on that cost, the most significant adjustment changes in assumptions. In other words, we said something last year that we're going to take back. And the most, <clears throat> the largest single adjustment, of course, is in DOD. For whatever reason, we adjusted prior period statements by $139 billion. And followed by the next biggie, there was only five adjustments. The second largest was VA, $58 billion. Well, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of, oops, I made a mistake in prior years, or oops, I'm going to change some of my I don't know, philosophy, accounting philosophy, whatever it might be. So, but by and large, without those two major, the rest of them come to a little bit less than $2 billion overall. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that we've got a net cost government wide that we now need to generate revenue to cover. And if you look at all of our, if you went to the statement of changes in net position, you start that with revenue that came in. And then you want to offset that, that you want to use that revenue to cover these expenses. Well, the total revenue in 2019 that came in from all the tax sources, $3.6 trillion. So that $3.6 trillion is what we needed to cover our net cost of operations. And when we had these adjustments that we made, about $200 billion of adjustments, we had $5 trillion, $5 trillion, $67 billion of costs that we had to cover. Well, if we had three six that we brought in and five that we needed to cover, oops, that left us with a operating loss for the period of $1.4 trillion. How are you going to make that up? I mean, these are bills that are going to have to be paid at some juncture. So we're going to have to figure out a way of finding an extra $1.4 trillion. And that was an increase to our national debt. So that number, that bottom line number, changed the net position. And let me back up a couple of, whoops, I just made a mess here, back up a couple of PowerPoints, position. The difference between the assets and the liabilities on our balance sheet. That shows you technically then what the bottom line worth of the federal government is. Now, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about assets, liability, well, assets. As those of you who had a accounting course you know that there's a basic principle of accounting that says that you book assets at cost. You book them at cost. How much did we pay for the Louisiana purchase? $15 billion. What's it worth today? I don't know. Nobody knows. You don't know what the worth of that land is until you go to sell it. So let's say, as I mentioned to you, we got $1.4 trillion loss of the period 2019 and i now want to i got to find 1.4 trillion dollars of cash well let's sell rocky mountain national park to the chinese now, hell they own everything else anyway let's sell it let's sell it for 1.4 trillion now i got the cash i have less assets now because now i've just disposed of rocky mountain national park which was a part of that 15 million that we spent for those what 587,000 miles square miles or acres or something of land which which is a part of that park let's sell it off 
rather than go out and borrow and add to our national debt. I don't worry too much about assets. What I'm concerned about is that liabilities number there. As a citizen, I want to see what our liabilities are. Again, you don't have the details on this, but if you did, there would be a line in there that is called federal debt securities held by the public. Hmm. Held by the public. Yeah. Um, I'd venture to guess that uh, but the civilians that are sitting in this audience, you've got the TSP, Thrift Savings Plan. That's your 401 plan, retirement plan. And a, I would venture to guess that you may very well have the G Fund as one of your revenue generating funds in there. And the G Fund means government. And that means that your fund manager is going to the government and buying some of these treasury bonds and bills that pay practically nickel, but it's very secure, supposedly very secure. In other words, the government's not going to default on these revenue bonds and bills. They don't pay a lot in terms of income, but they're very secure. Now, that's what we mean by public debt. Any member of the public that holds our debt. Now, here's why I'm bringing that up to you. At the end of 2019, fiscal year, 19, three years ago, the national debt held by the public, $16.8 trillion. What are we looking at now, three years later? That, they, you always hear them throw around, our national debt is approaching $30 trillion. But you have to look behind that number. And that is how much of that debt is held by the government, not by not by public, but by the government. Who's buying these treasury bonds and bills, as a matter of fact? Federal Reserve, punk, punching out dollars, punching out $20 bills, saying to the Treasury of the United States, or uh, to the Treasury of the United States, hey, I'll buy those treasury bonds and bills, and I'll buy here's some money. So all we're doing is pumping greenbacks into the into the economy, which dilutes the value of the greenback. So there's public debt and there's private debt. We're here. So here's some of the um, the uh, what do you want to call them? The laws that drive us to do what we do uh, in accounting in the federal government. And most of these you've seen already. Budget and Accounting Act 1921, which did, as I told you, three things. It uh, set up, required the president to have a consolidated budget for the entire federal government, all three branches. It gave him an office to do that, OMB, and it created the GAO. 1949, um, we created GSA. In GSA, we're going to be the property managers, except in DOD. DOD manages its own property. Now, that, that's a pretty interesting issue. One of the original issues that caused DOD not to get an opinion on their financial statements was the dollar value of the prop plant, the equipment that we showed, the assets, the equipment that we showed on our balance sheet. There's a, a line in there on the balance sheet called plant, property, and equipment, pp and &E. And we didn't know what the value of that line should be. So let's say I'm, I'm running a, a business and uh, an auditor comes in and I, we're going to audit General Motors. And General Motors says that they've got, um, oh, let's say, a $150 million building that makes up the assets that they're carrying on their, on their balance sheet. And let's say that that is a plant in, I don't know, Battle Creek, Michigan. 
and the um, auditor would come in and say, well, let me see that. Uh, how did you come up with that number, number one? Well, we bought and are built the plant for X number of dollars. We depreciate that over its useful life, and therefore it has a depreciated value on the books of X minus something, okay? depreciated value. Now, the first thing that if I'm an auditor, I'm going to say, well, I got to take a look at your depreciation factors here. I want to see your, your method that you got to that number. And secondly, I want to see the plant. I want to see if you still have it. Are you lying to me? Is it burnt down? Did you sell it? I want to go out and physically look at it. Well, that's what the auditors did when they came in to DOD. They said, hey, show me that tank. Show me that plane. Show me that ship. And we said, we don't know. We don't know where it's at. So what's really kind of interesting is that to come up with a number for the value, dollar value of our property, we went to GSA. Because since 1949, the law said GSA will be the property managers, but DOD will physically own plant property and equipment associated with DOD. But everything that DOD buys, a copy of that contract, will go to GSA. So GSA had property records on us. They didn't know depreciated value thereof. They didn't know if that ship was still floating or was at the bottom of the Pacific. They didn't know that. But they know what we bought. So originally, for the very first financial report that we generated back there in 1997, fiscal year 97, we went to GSA. We had no idea what we were doing. 1950, Accounting and Auditing Procedures Act um, <clears throat> required this apportionment process. And that was, again, basically driven by DOD, budgetary accounting, an appropriation, then it will be apportioned, and then it will be allotted. Okay, that that was the driven by DOD obligating the appropriations that it received from Congress at a rate where we would run out of budget authority prior to the end of the period. And then we had to go back to Congress and ask them for more money. The Navy was a big abuser of this, and. Yeah, you know, what what was Congress going to say? Well, um, just uh, turn off your ships. We don't have any money to pay for the ships or the sailors, and just float around out there for two months until we have a new fiscal year. No. So they were coerced into providing additional budget authority. Remember, I said to you, and Dave followed up, that Congress is a reactionary animal, and their reaction was, well, we are now going to make sure that OMB apportions money at a rate to assure that the agency doesn't run out of funds prior to the end of the period. Dave just completed the Prompt Pay Act with you. There's nothing new to tell you about that. He also just talked to you about the Debt Collection Act. There's nothing new to tell you about that. In 1982, we had the FMFIA. That's the Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act, which is basically internal controls. And we beat that to death with you previously. 1990 CFO Act. Okay, what did that do? Well, it required, number one, it said that the government, federal government, will, there was seven agencies that were identified as test agencies test bed, if you will, to generate proprietary financial statements. DOD obviously was not one of them. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then uh, it followed up with language requiring all 24 major federal agencies, of which DOD was one, to come up with a financial statement um, for fiscal year, at the end of fiscal year uh, 97, fiscal year 97. 1993, well, David beat that to death with you, talking about GPRA. And then 1994, we had 
Romer Government Management Reform Act, which um, did a number of things. And I guess the I want you to jot something down on this PowerPoint because you probably see this again. And that is that it amended that CFO Act to require a consolidated financial statement for the entire executive branch. See, the original act, 1990 act, with first just seven agencies, then expanded to 24 agencies, that was for individual agencies. And then what Congress said is, well, if you got these individual agencies, then let's roll all these things up and let's have an overall financial reports of the United States government. Okay, so that's probably something you want to make, make yourself aware of there. Which one modified that, sir? 1994 GMRA did three things. Required direct deposits of federal wages, salaries, and retirement payments. Dave mentioned that to you earlier in finance. Then it amended the CFO Act to require that consolidated financial statement. And it then required 24 CFO agencies to submit audited financial statements audited financial statements and those statements they gave us three years to do that the passage of the act in 1994 until the end of fiscal year 97 they gave us three years to do that the key word there is audited financial statements and we still dod still doesn't have auditable financial statements until let me back up until last year 21 there, there was a um the what do you call them? deputy i guess you could call him cfo uh dod cfo was a guy named mark easton really a nice guy uh, but i felt sorry for him because every year that i seen him he had less and less hair and it was getting more and more gray probably pulled a lot of it out actually but it was his responsibility as the deputy CFO to make this happen, to generate a auditable financial statement. And that's what he tried to do in 21. Then he retired. He's, he's gone up there now. But what he wanted to do was to get the financial reports to the position where the DODIG for audit could come in and say, here's what screwed up. And then see his logic then was, well, we're going to take this fire team now, this financial improvement audit remediation team, and we're going to address these thousands of areas that the DOD IG for audit said were wrong so that we could ultimately get a auditable financial, a, a clean opinion on a financial report, a clean opinion. 96, Federal Financial Management Improvement Act amongst other things, required um, agencies to come up with um, full cost accounting systems, reporting the full cost of what we do. And I mentioned that to you earlier at 1996 and uh, showed you that earlier that uh, Treasury is still working on trying to build that, that cost accounting system. It's really extremely difficult to do. The digital account, well, there's a couple of more, I guess. Let me let me back up here. Let me see if these other two, nope. Uh, let me think here. Okay, so let's go ahead and, you saw this, Dave addressed this before with you. Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know why it showed up in, in finance someplace, but um, I guess it was an in internal controls maybe is where it showed up. Yeah, but. The key thing here, look at that last bullet, the bottom line, what are they trying to do? The bottom line is to focus on standardization of accounting terms, systems, and the contents to enable, uh, of the financial reports to enable the public to better understand the reported information. And then making that information available 
via a, as it says here, a centralized website. So I told you that one of the things that if I were you, I would do is I would go to DOD and I would look for the 2021 financial reports of the Department of Defense, just so at least you can see what it looks like. Goes on, as I told you, for over 300 pages, but at least give you a kind of a warm and fuzzy what the heck's in there. But, but that's the thing that we're trying to get to the point where it can get a clean opinion, get any kind of opinion. We, we'd like a modified opinion to start with. Um, there's the second thing in here that you might want to highlight, and that's that second bullet on this PowerPoint, and that's that uh, it required Treasury to establish some common standards for financial data that pr that's provided by all government agencies and expand the amount of the data the agencies must provide in a government website called USA Spending. Really kind of a neat site, usaspending.gov. You ought to look it up sometime. It's really interesting. It's a central website that will show, for example, uh, how much the Navy spends on medical supplies, let's say, and who you spend it with. I, I used it a couple of years ago when I was trying to figure out where agencies in the federal government, Army, Navy, Air Force, were buying their training from, because I wanted to see, you know, who might I compete against as a as an as a corporation? I was able to go in there and see how much Navy might have spent regarding buying training from the graduate school, or possibly management concepts or somebody else. It's really it's really kind of a neat report. It's it's can be used by the citizen to see where their money is being spended. That's what I'm trying to say. Digital accountability and transparency. So. Federal financial management then. Basically talking about the three amigos. OMB, GAO, and the Treasury. These three got together back in 1990 as a byproduct of the CFO Act and signed a memorandum of agreement that created a board, a body, that would have the responsibility to issue GAAP, GAAP being generally accepted accounting principles, for the federal government. Now, let me go to this next PowerPoint. For the now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that other PowerPoint, but let me just get you here first. For the general commercial businesses, business organizations, commercial, and for non-governmental not-for-profits, non-governmental not-for-profit, Red Cross as an example, there is a board called the Federal Accounting Standards, excuse me, Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is basically generating gap that public accountants, auditors would use when reviewing the financial statements of commercial businesses. Did that business follow? generally accepted accounting principles in the booking, in the recording, in the journalizing of activities. And if they didn't, well, then we're going to give them a, a not, not a clean position. We're going to give them a modified accounting position, an audit. Now, this goes back to the 1930s as a byproduct of the Great Depression. You know, it was there was a wild, wild west back in those days in terms of financial reports and companies doing their thing. Everybody did whatever they wanted to do. So they said, whoa, time out. Let's develop some accounting principles and practices that should be used 
U.S. wide, corporations wide. Everybody's going to follow these. And if you don't follow them, you're not going to get a clean opinion. If you don't get a clean opinion, well, then investors may very well be a little reluctant to dump money into you to buy stock. And also banks, financial institutions may may very well be somewhat reluctant to lend you money. 1930s. 1984, the non-federal governments, state and local governments, decided that there needed to be some generally accepted accounting practices, principles for states and uh, local governments, municipal governments. So in 1984, this Government Accounting Standards Board was created. And it generates, it promulgates standards for how states will do their accounting to treat their operations. And again, uh, let's say I'm at the state of Missouri and uh, let's say that uh, I want to send one of my kids to college. And I'm interested in seeing, let's say a, um, oh, I don't know, a uh, pre pre-dental program and I'm going, to, I'm going to pull up a financial report from the uh, Missouri University of Missouri and let's say University of Illinois right across the river here Illinois and I want to look at that information and maybe one of the things I would look at is grants that were received by a, a school within that university I might also want, because that has a bearing upon how much money they might spend per student. In other words, what's their endowment? Um, How many scholarships they offer and what's the level of the scholarships? But if I want to look at the financial statement from the University of Missouri and the financial statement from the University of Illinois, I should feel comfortable that the accountants that worked in there were capturing information and journalizing the information under the same standards. And that's what they used GASB for. Now, that led to FASB, uh, the federal, uh, excuse me, FASB, GASB, FASAB, the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. And that again was created there in 1990 by, now let me go back to this previous PowerPoint here that was created via this memorandum of agreement memorandum of understanding signed by OMB GAO and the Treasury now under or alongside Treasury there I want you to write the following down or on this PowerPoint someplace you can have an arrow going back to Treasury but it's a Treasury responsibility is what I'm trying to say Accounting classification codes, GLACs, general ledger account codes, link, link appropriations to specific budget authority. Okay, one more time. Accounting classification codes are GLACs link the appropriations to specific budget authority. What does that mean? Budgetary accounting standards and the general ledger accounts that we will use to track status of funds comes out of the Treasury. There's about a hundred general ledger account codes. You might remember that way back in mod 2 comp 1 we had a one little PowerPoint in there that talked about status of funds report. And I think there might have been five or six general ledger accounts in there. And it was like appropriations, unapportioned appropriations, um, um, apportionments, unobligated uh, uh, allotment, um, unliquidated obligations, and then outlays. That was only five or six of a hundred GLACs. The second thing I want you to jot down here, and I've mentioned it to you already, but here it is again. Treasury publishes the U.S. Standard General Ledger. 
which therefore then feeds to all financial reports that are used in generating financial statements of the US of the US government. Okay? In other words, who keeps the books? The general ledger. Treasury. Treasury. What we do in DOD that DFAS does for us, that financial information that's contained and run by DFAS feeds into the Treasury along with transactions information for every other federal agency. And that makes up this standard U.S. standard general ledger. And then from that U.S. standard general ledger, Treasury will generate their annual financial reports. And I talked about three of those with you just a little bit ago. Now, FASAB. FASAB is responsible for the codifying, writing into the codes, writing the generally accepted accounting principles for the federal government. That's their role. And they issue, you might put that on here someplace, SFFAS, that's Statements of Federal Financial Accounting Standards. And they also issue SFFACs, that's Statements of Federal Financial Accounting Concepts. Concepts and standards is what they generate. Okay. Again, they talk a little bit more about those three amigos, OMB, GAO, and the Treasury. Now, OMB, well, number one, these three entities Are they share overall responsibility for accounting within the federal government? So OMB, as I mentioned to you, via the writing of regulations and circulars, they generate the guidance that will be used in all federal agencies regarding accounting standards. The standards themselves are generated by, statements of standards themselves are generated by the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, but they then need to be promulgated. And OMB does that. Now, one of the things that the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board does is says, Here's the form and the content of the financial reports that will be used in the federal government. OMB promulgates that in the form of a circular. That's A136, A136. You need to make, make a note of that along that OMB line up there. That's their, when we're talking about accounting standards, that's what they're doing. Amongst other things, they say, here is, here are the types of financial statements that every federal agency needs to generate, and here's what they will look like. Here's what they will contain. A form and content. GAO. Their major responsibility is generating auditing standards. And Dave's going to cover those with you this afternoon. Auditing standards. And they are published in... Dave's already told you about this, the yellow book. And they're referred to as GAGAS. G-A-G-S, G-A-G-A-S, Generally Accepted Government Auditing Standards. Well, why did they have to do that? Well, let's say I am um, Department of Interior and I want to have my annual financial reports audited. Well, who's going to audit them? Well, I'm going to contract that out with Deloitte. What is Deloitte going to use as acceptable standards to do that audit? 
they're going to use the standards as set by GAGAS, by GAO and contained in GAGAS. Then Treasury, I mentioned to you, had basically the overall responsibilities of issuing the TFM, Treasury Financial Manual, which lists all of the generally accepted um, account codes, GLACs, for both budgetary and proprietary. You find that in the TFMs, Treasury Financial Manuals. Federal accounting standards, they talk about. Accounting standards consider the financial and budgetary information needs of citizens. I mean, what do citizens want to see? I want to look at these financial statements and having some rudimentary interest, I guess, or understanding of what goes on, let's say, in the Department of Education, Department of Energy. I want to look at what they did. I want to look at what the cost of programs are. I want to see how much they expended. Then there are congressional oversight groups, Congress. Congress jumps in and says, we want to see what's going on in your financial information. The executive agencies themselves. We mentioned this before, you would hope that the agency heads would be somewhat attuned to and interested in taking a look at their operations, you know, not just sitting in a big office behind a LMD, large mahogany desk, and drawing down a salary, that they're truly interested in finding out maybe the best way that this agency should run, be operated. Then our last bullet is um, the people that uh, lend money to the government, the people that are buying government treasury bonds and bills. Now, I would hope that the trust fund manager, the G fund manager in your TSP would be interested in looking at some of the financial reports of the federal government to see what's going on, see if you're comfortable with it. I mean, banks are going to do that to a commercial operation. They're just not going to throw money at you all the time. They're going to say, let me see your financials. Let me see if we can afford to lend you money or not. There are today nine. SFFACs. Now there's eight on here. There's a ninth that was issued in May of 2020. It's not on here yet, but that's okay. You don't need to know it. But of the ones that are on here, you need to have a little understanding and background of what some of these statements, these concept statements are, SFFACs, financial accounting concepts. What are they? Well, that first one up there, talks about objectives of federal financial reporting. Why do we do what we do with proprietary accounting? And you know, this is basically the, 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 the reason, the rationale as to why we're going to try to generate financial statements that um, your neighbor next door who doesn't know anything about budgetary accounting, appropriation accounting, would be able to look at. So along where that, maybe I don't know, right up here in this blank spot, write down stewardship, stewardship. That's the basic reason why we do this. We are stewards of the people's money. It's not our funds. It's not our funds. We are the stewards of the people's money. Second thing they talk about is entity and display. Now, this is spelled out, and you might want to write again here, OMB Circular A-136. That's the SFFAC number two spells out a concept statement regarding what will be an entity, how do we define an entity? And you might remember I opened up this, mor or this, uh, this morning when I started accounting with you, telling you that there are 
in DOD and the components, Army, Navy, Air Force, there's two entities in each. And one entity is we're going to generate, we're running a business that's funded with direct appropriations. Then there is another business that we run, which is the working capital funds. So there's two entities, Army, Navy, Air Force. And as I told you this, when I started this thing, that we've received disclaimers, Army, Navy, Air Force, for both sides, both the general funds and the working capital funds. And I'm really kind of disappointed, to tell you the truth, that these working capital funds, and you know that's that concept that we showed you earlier, David talked to you about, that existed started back there in 1990 i'm really kind of feeling sorry i'm upset i guess you could say that you mean that we don't know how to run a business i mean that's pure business that's selling a service selling goods selling supply items and we don't know how to do that yet well, apparently not because we continue to get disclaimers on those number three mda talks about management's discussion and analysis. This is kind of like the commanders, like the president, like the CEO's comments. Hey, look at us, we're so great, look what we do. You know, we run ships, we fly planes, we drive tanks, we're great. MDA, management's discussion and analysis. Now you don't have enough paper here on this PowerPoint, but you need to jot down two more things. I'm going to read them to you here. Significant accounting, significant accounting, principles and policies used by an organization should be summarized. Where? The answer is in the footnotes. In the footnotes. The agency's financial report, let's see here, this is uh, DOD. Footnotes. There are. Sir, sir what, 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 um, what number are you under for this? Is this just, still under number? Just write it. it, it it's a. It's a statement regarding um, management's discussion and analysis, concepts, how we do what we do, okay? And one of the things in there talks about and relates you to, let's go to statement number, uh, let's see what one is it here, it's number four. In other words, what are we going to show in those financial reports? And the thing I wanted to bring up to your attention is that you understand that in DOD, there are 107 pages of footnotes. So there's 107 pages of the 305 pages that are just footnotes, just footnotes. That's where you find the bulk of your information. And one of those things that would show in there is what drove you in terms of entity and display? What is driving you towards or led you to um, report something in a specific method, specific methodology, a specific format? You go to the footnotes to see that. Now, one other thing I want you to jot down, and that is info other than dollars. There's a lot of stuff that shows up in the financial statements that's other than just dollars. That should be provided, reported in required supplemental info, RSI. Now I'm going to talk to you one of the very last things here in this accounting area this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about RSI, these required supplemental statements, RSI, required supplemental information. Okay. 
So you need to kind of file that one away. That's basically all you need to know about these. Not these eight SF. Uh, uh, SFFACs. All right, that's probably as good as place as any to break. When you get back, talk a little bit and take a look at SFFAS's statements of standards. So I got noon. I'll see you back here at one uh, Eastern time, and we will well, probably finish this up by two thirty ish. Be another hour and a half, I guess. I can finish it up and. Dave ought to be doing about an hour and a half, maybe, of auditing. Maybe. I'm saying we'll probably be done today by four o'clock ish. Okay. So see you in an hour.